The broadcast is now starting. All attendees are in listen-only mode. Good morning and thanks for joining us this morning for our look at mobile threat prevention. Uh, my name is Shona Bradshaw. I'll be introducing our um, guest speaker, who's Phil Woon, who's the uh, mobile threat prevention specialist for Checkpoint Software Technologies. Uh, he'll be taking through, you through the bulk of the presentation today um, regarding how businesses can protect their business from mobile threats. To give a very quick overview of the objective today, um, just please do anyone, if there's any audio problems, flag those via the um, questions box. I will keep this a little short and I apologise in advance as I do have a slight head cold so hopefully you can hear me clearly. Um, today's objective is to give customers insight into the form, the common anatomy um, of the most prevalent threats that are currently affecting users and, and networks via mobile devices um, and how those mobile devices are currently being exploited to infiltrate organisations. Um, Philip will also be presenting some of the currently available solutions to mitigate those threats as well. Um, a brief agenda for today, um, he will be sharing what threats are increasing, um, common threat patterns and things to watch for um, in terms of uh, mobile attacks, um, how businesses can fight back against mobile attacks, some of the strategies that people can put in place, and then lastly, how your options for dealing with things like mobile malware specifically before we do a QA. and a A little bit of housekeeping for you. Um, attendee lines will be on mute throughout the presentation to keep the flow of the presentation. However, please do post questions via chat. Um, there will be a QA and a at the end, so all the questions that you post via chat we can, we can cover off in the end. I'll be posing those to Phil. Um, and we'll also follow up any that we can't deal with on the line with your account managers. Um, we will keep um, discussions to strategic and technical um, demos today. We won't be talking um, finances or commercials, um, though, of course, um, further discussions regarding anything you see are welcome with your account managers after the webinar. Um, lastly, we will have a survey at the end. Please do fill it in so we can make sure that these sessions continue to hit the mark for you and remain um, useful and insightful sessions. And we will provide a recording after the webinar and share that with you to share at your leisure with your teams. So a little bit about us, I'll keep it brief because most of you probably know us. Um, we're Byte Security Partnerships. Um, we were up until 2001, a, um, so 2011, a small independent reseller focusing solely on network security. Um, and in 2011, we were purchased by the Byte Technology Group, who are one of the larger resellers in the UK. Since uh, acquisition, we have been working very hard to combine the specialism and agility that we had as a small independent reseller, um, you know, coupling that with some of the resources and the backing of a large group. Um, as part of that, we're really passionate about security education. Um, it's the reason why we run sessions like today and some of our um, updates across the UK. Um, we do have a sole focus on security, so we don't look into any other technologies. Um, we focus on network, web content and application security, and that's what we're renowned for. Um, and that allows us to offer considerable technical expertise. Um, we're one of just two Checkpoint Four Star Elite partners, so we're really proud of our history and long-standing relationship with Checkpoint. It's one of the reasons that we can ask for their resource to present some of their solutions out to you. Um, so with that done, our intro done, uh, all that remains for me to do is to hand over to Phil. Um, thanks very much for your time in joining us this morning, and I'll leave it to Phil to cover the rest of the presentation with you. Thank you very much, Shona. I'm just going to share my screen now. Please let me know if I, if I do anything wrong. Okay, so I believe that at this point in time, I'm sharing my screen with everybody. Uh, yes, I can I also see assume that slides and your email in the back. Excellent. <laughs> yeah. Sure, I've got a whole bunch of things going on right now for the demonstration Should today. That for the demo? Okay, so thank you, gentlemen. Thank you ever so much for your, your time this morning. It's very valuable to us. Um, I'd like to address one key question as a part of the scope for today's um, session. And that's really around why the world could do with or would need better mobile security. In order to answer that question, I want to run through kind of how we got to the point that we're at today in terms of the trends moving forward. 
I want to discuss and explore the mobile threat landscape, specific threats related to mobile devices and uh, some good examples, followed by um, a demonstration of a, one of those uh, examples. So we'll go into a uh, demonstration on some iOS devices and I'll give you guys some insights into ways to compromise the device. And uh, lastly, leading on to uh, how we can protect a device. So what I want to explore is the checkpoint special source. You know, what, what are our secret ingredients when it comes to mobile security and how we can help your organizations improve your uh, defenses against mobile specific threats. So without further ado, let's look at how we arrived at this point today. I think the key story behind mobile adoption is consumerization. Consumer, consumerization of IT is, uh, is pretty much prolific. I've uh, heard stories from my colleagues. I, I don't currently have uh, a family myself, but I've heard of uh, colleagues where they've got young children. They don't ask for you know, train sets and, and, and Barbie dolls anymore. They want technology, they want iPads, they want Android tablets for Christmas and for their birthdays. Everybody loves these devices. Also, there is a trend where youngsters, uh, we call them digital natives, are starting work now for the first time. Many of these were born in the 90s. They've never known a world without the internet. For them, connectivity is a right. Uh, I guess you could almost say that in order of their human rights, they would say water, food, shelter, and then Wi-Fi. That's how important the connectivity and the internet are to this generation. And you may have seen this picture before, but I think it really sums up graphically that adoption. Um, St. Peter's Square, 2005, the death of one pope, and in uh, 2013, the birth of another, uh, or inauguration of, of a new pope. Same place, different time, and everybody chooses to look at the world through the lens of a, of a mobile device, as opposed to with their own eyeballs. So that really does show, you know, in an illustrative way, how uh, ubiquitous these devices are now in our lives. So, of course, this is mirrored quite obviously in terms of, of sales statistics. The smartphone and the tablet far outweigh the sales of uh, traditional Windows and uh, Mac PCs and desktops. You could almost say at this point in time that the new endpoint, that the first device of choice is actually a mobile device as opposed to a trad traditional thick client as it was previously. So uh, let's just say that moving forward, the, the endpoint is now the mobile device. So why would an organization want to adopt mobility and kind of go with this flow of consumerization? Well, in terms of business value, it's quite clear from the data that uh, I borrowed uh, very kindly from IBM that uh, looks at how organizations derive value from this approach. Um, it's key. Uh, to, to point out that you know, the most important aspect for many organizations is the flexibility and the productivity angle. So users have the ability to work anywhere, anytime, uh, you know, wherever they are in the world, using a mobile device. So it increases productivity quite, quite considerably. Also, there's the angle that um, cost savings um, can be derived from mobility, especially when we start talking about bring your own initiatives, where, of course, the organization hasn't had to provide hardware to the end users, and in many cases, the end user is their own support technician and their own support help desk uh, because it's a personally owned device with, the, with their own data on and they purchase the device. They're generally inclined to learn how to use it and understand it. And as a result, they don't have the ability to call on the organization uh, for support. They support themselves. So you could say that you know, it works out a lot cheaper in that respect as well. And lastly, attracting staff to our company. So that goes back to what I mentioned before about digital natives. So if you want to attract young talent into your organization, giving them you know, the tools that they believe they need to be effective and giving them the connectivity and the, uh, the, the flexibility and the mobility they look for can be a great way of securing you know, innovative uh, young talent into your organization. So I guess really to boil it all down, what we're looking for is, is the ability to provide productivity and cost savings to the organization, productive, and in some cases, cheaper end users. We know that devices are everywhere, they're finding their way into business. Well, what kind of devices are we talking about? Well, there's no real surprises here that, you know, predominantly we're looking at laptops and smartphones. 
they're the traditional tools of the trade for anybody that need, you know is is a field based salesperson or you know does a lot of travel. But even you know general uh, purpose employees would, would probably be using this approach as well uh, at this point in time because they can work from home, they can work on the train, they can work in the office, they can work everywhere. The tablet and the hybrid device they've got more traction in, in business now. Um, the hybrid device, if you're not familiar, is where you have the screen and the tablet connected together and then you can detach them so you have basically a laptop and a tablet all in one. What I found really interesting from this IBM data was the 5% of organizations supporting wearable technology. So that's that's pretty fresh, that's pretty innovative. Um, you know, I've not come across many organizations here in the UK that are supporting wearable technology for business use, but I'm really, you know, pleased to see that that's starting to make an appearance. You know, describe that kind of organization as that's a pretty hipster organization. They're supporting the latest technology and getting business value from that. I was also quite surprised to see that there's 5% of organizations that support none of the above. So I have to brand those as a bit of a Jurassic organization that may be a little bit behind the times. So this wearable technology situation, I thought that that was worth exploring. However, from a security perspective, it was clear to me that, yes, these devices are, you know, they're cool, they're innovative, they are designed with consumers in mind, therefore usability, um, interoperability, performance, and, you know, ease of use in particular are the main concerns and the main requirements for this device. Security is a long way down the list of, of top requirements or key requirements for this kind of device. So as a result, there's unaddressed vulnerabilities and weak connection encryption and, and weak authentication on these on these consumer devices. So if we see that trend continue, where more of these devices are adopted by business, that could introduce you know more in the world of uh, mobile vulnerabilities and you know additional vulnerabilities into the landscape, into the business landscape. So I thought that was definitely something worth thinking about, and it's a nice pathway into my next uh, topic, which is the mobile threat landscape. So I just want to talk in particular about you know, mobile specific threats, how they work and what impact they could have. Before I do that, I just want to give you a quick 101 if you're not familiar with mobile threats. The most prolific type of mobile threat is the mobile malware, and more specifically, the mobile remote access Trojan. So this is essentially Trojanized apps, Trojanized uh, applications for you know, iOS and Android that contain a little surprise in there, which allow an attacker to either gain root access to the phone, access the device, or steal data from the device. Second most common attack is network-based. So this is where we start to see you know, Wi-Fi hotspots, uh, traffic sniffing on the Wi-Fi hotspot, um, attackers setting up their own Wi-Fis, um, tricking users into accepting certificates and profiles where they can read SSL traffic via a man-in-the-middle attack uh, and also redirect traffic to a remote web server so they can store all of your information, usernames, passwords, and credentials for, for later. The last kind of mobile threat that we see is an exploit for operating system vulnerabilities, and there's been a spate of vulnerabilities in the news recently, um, most particularly for Android OS, uh, but of course we have seen a couple of interesting ones for iOS uh, over the year as well. So that probably is a good point at which to highlight some of the lowlights for 2015 in terms of those uh, various vulnerabilities from the, from the three areas that we see. So mask attack for iOS is based on uh, application vulnerabilities, wire lurker for iOS based on OS vulnerabilities, stage fright, you may have heard of this recently, it's been pretty big in the news. Uh, this is an OS vulnerability for Android, and I'll talk a little bit more about that in a moment. Certificate, this is uh, application and OS uh, vulnerabilities due to the way that uh, vendors produce uh, baked-in software to the, uh, the, the, the read-only build they provide on the Android devices. We've seen some really innovative and interesting banking trojans in the Far East and in the USA on uh, an Born Storm threat campaign against iOS. You can see where I'm going with this, guys. It's been a really bad year in the sense of mobile threats. Um, more advanced ransomware for Android devices, adware for iOS and Android, and Xcode Ghost, which is the most recent of the uh, threats that we've seen in the news. So when we talk about you know, all of these bad things, what's the worst that could happen? You know, what, what's, what's the big deal? 
Well, it's my personal view that a compromised mobile phone is more intrusive and more dangerous to the end user's personal privacy and their information than potentially on a desktop computer. The reason being, a mobile phone has several powerful sensors and very, very powerful uh, data gathering capabilities that could be very invasive. Uh, let me give you some insights into that. For example, the GPS tracking on the mobile phone, uh, if you can leverage that information, you can see everywhere the user's been, everywhere they've visited, and uh, you know trace their movements over a Also, um, you know, web messages as well, WhatsApp messages. To take take things to the next level for an evasion of privacy, um, more sophisticated malware can actually leverage the microphone and the camera on the device in order to eavesdrop or even, you know, have a look around through the camera, which is very, very dangerous and very, very powerful for corporate espionage purposes. And lastly, if I was feeling particularly unpleasant and I was, uh, you know, in control of your mobile device, I might choose to delete your data, lock your data, encrypt your data in uh, you know, response to a ransom. So I might uh, ransom your phone for a Bitcoin or something of that similar value. So very intrusive into the personal user's data, very intrusive into you know, their communications. Um, you could argue that this is, you know, from an end user perspective, much more worrying uh, than you know, uh, an infected desktop or traditional laptop machine. Okay, so let me give you a little bit more detail on some of the more exciting and uh, interesting th threats that we've seen this year from our own research development and uh, from the press in general. Um, Xcode Ghost, this was very interesting because it took mobile attacks down to, I guess you could say, step zero, where we actually um, saw attackers infect the toolkits that are used to create um, iOS applications. So this meant that it circumvented the controls that Apple put in place for filtering out you know, malicious apps from the App Store and found its way into initial estimates with 300 applications, but further estimates from other security vendors actually point towards close to 4,000 applications hosted on the Apple App Store containing the command and control uh, code from the Xcode Ghost toolkit. So what this really means is that users are, you know, are believing uh, typically that apps on the App Store have already been passed and they are you know, given the thumbs up, they're clean. Uh, and they don't need to worry about additional layers of security. This proves that that's not really the case. Um, a real-world example, apologies for the resolution on the WebEx, this is a bit hard to see. One of my colleagues in France uh, last week actually sent me a screenshot from one of his customers using our product that had an application in their environment created with this Chinese Xcode Ghost infected toolkit. So, you know, Third-party vendors, if you outsource any app development and you had any app development done in China, there is a, there's a small risk that your applications could have been created with this toolkit. Without mobile security on your devices, you have no idea that this resides in your environment. And of course, you know this particular application would have had the ability to steal data from the mobile device due to the nature of the, uh, of, of the malware injection. So, you know, back to my original point at the start of the presentation, this is another reason why mobile security needs to be uh, considered more seriously in many organizations, because it's not as clear cut as, you know, whitelists and blacklists. We don't go to these app stores, we don't download these apps. You could have legitimate business apps with mal code embedded inside it from the point it was created. Something to think about, I hope. So here's another example on Android this time rather than iOS. So this is a, actually a game uh, called Brain Test, and this the reason I'm highlighting this this particular game is that it shows an advancement in sophistication when we talk about mobile threats. So Brain Test was actually um, very clever in the way that it installed an anti-uninstall watchdog that stops you from being able to remove the infected application that had root access to your device. So it contained a root kit, it rooted the phone when you installed the game and then put on an additional service which acted as a watchdog. So if the user used the game, it would then use the watchdog service to reinstall it. And of course it had root access, so it could bring down additional code in order to you know, create a backdoor on the device. So it showed an advancement in the way that um, Malware authors have invested time and money into creating more sophisticated Android uh, malware. And I think 
due to the amount of devices that are out there now and the way they contain such useful personal and business information, there's going to be further investment from malware authors into creating more and more sophisticated uh, malware for mobile devices. And you know, they're, they're diverting resources away from traditional infection routes through laptops and desktops and vulnerabilities in, in Flash and Java into researching more closely vulnerabilities in the iOS and Android operating systems. So lastly, here's an example of what potentially you shouldn't do in reaction to a mobile vulnerability. I won't tell you who this customer is, but this was supplied to me from one of my colleagues in Germany, where in reaction to stage fright, they had no understanding of which versions of Android were out there, which versions were actually vulnerable, and then how to deal with the vulnerabilities in their Android estate. So as a result, they had to stand up a separate process whereby users could no longer receive media messages on the device. If you're not familiar with stage fright, the vulnerability is triggered by some malicious code embedded in a media message sent to a mobile phone. So that's what made it so particularly scary, I guess you could say. They knee -jerk react. The knee-jerk reaction to this was to actually switch off all of the mobile media messaging on their devices and stand up a separate process whereby they force users to redirect to a web page, input a you know a 12-digit, a very long pin code in order to open the uh, you know the picture. The, the sound file or the, the video file that was sent to them from a separate web page. Um, so as a result, you created additional overhead for users. You had to stand up an additional process, and you know nobody is a winner in this situation because of the extra cost, complexity, and you know user dissatisfaction associated with this reaction. It would have been better for this organisation to have mobile security to understand where the vulnerabilities are, so they can direct their patching and direct their you know security resources towards mitigating the problem rather than just you know swerving it trying to avoid it and putting in a separate process to deal with it so another example of why you know mobile security android vulnerabilities ios vulnerabilities and of course the various application threats i've just talked about so just to sum all that up um, before i go into my uh, my demonstration mobile devices are everywhere they have our pit business data they have our personal data and in many cases, I talk to organizations that have no defenses for their mobile platforms, so the devices are broadly undefended. So as a result, you could summarize these devices are an interesting and uh, you know, convenient backdoor into many organizations to either steal data, to compromise the device for espionage purposes, or you know, extort money from, from end users. So something to think about on, from that perspective. So the next thing I'd like to do for you guys is just give you a quick example of a mobile threat that I can demonstrate on an iOS device. So while I'm doing this in the background, I just want you guys to think very briefly about what you think might be the easiest way to compromise a mobile device. And what I'm going to do is just share my Apple iPhone with everybody using the AirPlay. Okay, looks good to me. So I'm hoping the resolution is good enough for everybody to see. So the situation here is that um, I'm going to log into my secure container, my checkpoint uh, capsule workspace, where I actually have all of my business data. So I have a separate layer of authentication that I log into. So great for a BYOD device that might not have very strong pin code or any pin code at all. I can put a separate container on here for business data with my authentication requirements covered. So I've got emails from my friends, my family, my wife, um, of, but more, in most particular, I've got my business information here as well. So email, calendar, contacts, you know, the usual things you'd expect to see. I've also got various HTML5 web apps in here. So if I'm on the road, I can, you know, submit a help desk ticket directly through to the help desk from the mobile phone using the HTML5 app. Um, and I can also app wrap um, native uh, iOS apps and bring them into the container as well. So then I have the, you know, the security context around that business application inside the secure container. And it's, you know, it's easy for the end user because it's all in one place as well. So I digress. If I head back to my email, I've got an example of what I would call um, a phishing email here. Welcome to the 2015 mobile conference. So the background around this is uh, we used to do something very similar at the 
RSA conference uh, in the USA, where we, um, I guess you could say, did something a little bit naughty, where we changed some of the QR codes on the posters and invited end users to uh, install um, the RSA conference app with a little surprise in there. Needless to say, you know, that didn't go down very well. It's a very exciting demonstration and it proved the point, but obviously that, that it, it upset RSA somewhat, so we've rebranded everything to make sure that you know, it's a little bit uh, less uh, um, impactful to, uh, to other parties. So now we're calling it the, the annual mobile conference. So it just gives you an idea of the context behind this and where it came from and why we do this. Um, the reason being is that uh, if you are connected to the Wi-Fi network at a conference, you know, next time you go to Black Cat or next time you go to uh, the Excel Arena for, for a conference, you're on public Wi-Fi. That means that the traffic is in the clear, could be sniffed by anybody that's also connected to the public Wi-Fi. From there, it's very easy to grab email addresses and certain credentials that are in the clear. So I could send out phishing emails very much like this one. So from here, you can see that I've assumed that you know, you're an attendee at the mobile conference, seeing as you're attached to the Wi-Fi at the conference. And as a result, you'd really quite benefit from the mobile conference application. And you can do so by clicking the link or scanning the QR code. This is that this is now taking me to an external website. So I'm leaving the relative safety of my secure container. So this is the same for any secure container, not necessarily the checkpoint. If you're already using a secure container, um, it would be a similar situation. So the next step is I'm actually taken on to a phishing website. So you know, forgive me, it's not very sophisticated, but it just gives you a view of the fact that you've been re redirected to a website in order to download the mobile conference application, tells you the features, how useful it is. And in you know, most cases, you'll be like, yeah, this is exactly what I need. I'm at the conference, I've been given an email, it must be, leg must be legitimate. I'd like to download from the App Store using my Apple device. So I hit the App Store on the device and Give me a second. You'll notice that it doesn't actually redirect me to the App Store at all. It's silently downloading in the background. So what I end up with is a sideloaded application for the mobile application conference on here. So something that you know not many users are aware of is that not every application that you install on iOS must come from the App Store. It is possible to sideload applications from third-party websites, and also, you know, with the ongoing um, commitment that Apple has to enterprise deployments, we may well see more functions whereby organisations can sign up to their own certificates and load them from any other source that they like. So, as a result, I've installed the mobile conference app on here. Of course, we put a disclaimer on here because it's our own custom malware, um, but. The end user is pretty much oblivious at this point as to what's going on. This is, um, oh, sorry, I've got a pop-up here. So I've got a, got a couple of passwords on here which actually stop people from accidentally installing our malware and deploying the malware, so I just need to authenticate to that. Okay, so, <laughs> sorry about that. So I've uh, supplied a password just to get the, the application on the device. Um, it's, there's a disclaimer on the application to let you know there's, there's mobile malware. But to all intents and purposes, the real malware would never have this in the real world, of course. I'd never want to alert a user to the fact that this has potential backdoor and, and remote mobile access Trojan capabilities. So at this point, you know, the application is installed on the mobile device. The end user is pretty much unaware as to what's going on. I'm going to close that down. I'm going to head over to my command and control server. So in the background, I have attacker capabilities baked into this application. <clears throat> so we've just created a simple front end for this Trojan horse, whereby I can use two capabilities. I can steal um, metadata or information about the user and about the device from the phone. And the second uh, capability is I can actually leverage the uh, microphone permissions through the application and exfiltrate voice data through the application out to the command and control server over the internet. So I'm going to go ahead and collect some metadata. Um, this is depending on the, on the 3G connection I've got on my mobile phone and how quick that comes through. And uh, also I'll go ahead and grab some voice data as well. 
One of the great things about taking a mobile phone is that 99% of the time it's connected to some kind of network. So whether it's on the Wi-Fi, whether it's on 3G, 4G, or you know even you know the slower network services, you can generally get packets of, of data to the device. So it's easy to attack and track from anywhere in the world at any time. So you start to see some of the uh, the incident data coming, the, the information coming through here. So let me give you visibility of some of the data I've just stolen from the phone. So you know I've stolen friends and family and colleagues' uh, phone numbers uh, from the from the address book. I've leveraged the GPS information inside the mobile device, so I've been able to pinpoint using sat nav coordinates exactly where that device is at that point in time. And I could obviously multi take multiple GPS coordinates in order to track the movements of the user as well. If I dump this information into Google Maps, you, know, you can see there we are. Here's, here's my uh, here's my house in Cheshire where I'm doing this web demo from. So the second thing I want to show was the capture of the voice data. So um, obviously I'm doing this through a WebEx recording and uh, it's coming through my speakers. I don't know if this is going to come through the microphone, um, but I have actually recorded. I to understand the time it's connected to some kind of network, so whether it's voice data from the device, or you know even you know the slower network services. You can generally get packets. So I'm fingers crossed here that this comes out on the WebEx. If not, track from anywhere in the world. I can do this. Uh, can send you the voice file. Okay, so hopefully this gave you an insight into you know some of the capabilities that you can have in mobile malware and how intrusive that can be. If I now head back to the presentation, I guess at this point it's important to answer that original question. It's the user, right? The easiest way to attack a device is to social engineer a situation where you trick the end user into installing your payload, installing your malware, without having to write exploits for vulnerabilities without having to you know, create advanced sophisticated malware. It's a case of uh, you know, tricking an end user into infecting themselves is, is by far the easiest route in to any mobile device. And uh, hopefully the demonstration today showed you that it's not terribly difficult to architect a situation where you socially engineer a user into infecting themselves with some very powerful malware. Okay, so what can Checkpoint do about this situation? How can we help? What is our, you know, our unique value in this area? Well, I guess first of all, it's key to highlight that we want to help customers on their maturity journey when it comes to security tools, especially in the mobile space. Um, typically, I see most customers deploying an MDM tool, which is very, very valuable and very, very powerful because it serves as a, as a foundation for device enrollment, for device enablement. However, it does have limited capabilities when it comes to protecting you against mobile threats. It's more useful for static policy enforcement, such as storage uh, requirements, you know, device requirements, uh, pin code requirements. I guess you could say you know, the basic security requirements, but it doesn't address the more advanced security requirements. The next step I tend to see on the maturity journey is that customers are using them in anger, using the devices in anger. They have personal and corporate data residing on the device. They need to implement some kind of data and app containerization in order to protect the company data and obviously comply with you know, requirements and legislation that they might be subject to and you know, look after their intellectual property if it resides on mobile devices. So that's where you know, Checkpoint starts to come in. You know, we're, we're a pure play security vendor. We don't provide management tools. We don't compete with the management tools. We, in fact, partner and integrate with the management tools. However, we are more interested in how we protect your, your, your data and your application information. And we're very, very interested, as you'd expect, in how we protect you against uh, known and unknown threats. So that's really how we want to help customers along the maturity curve to the point where they have full management capabilities, they have full data and app containerization, especially for BYOD situations, and also they are given peace of mind they can protect their devices against the, the known and generic threats as well as the more advanced zero-day threats in the landscape as well. So how do we do that? We have a portfolio of products that are designed to satisfy various mobility security use cases. Let's shine a spotlight first of all on our mobile threat prevention. So the technology behind the threat prevention is summarized as advanced app analysis. So we do the sandbox simulation of, of various applications, 
static code analysis and also human analysis as well of the various aspects of the, the application, what permissions it requires and how it interacts with the operating system. And that gives us the ability to do anomaly detection, especially for network attacks as well. So this is, is quite key to highlight, but there are many tools out there today which are able to do you know, basic antivirus and also basic app reputation, but they're unable to look at anomalies around network connectivity, traffic inception, um, certificates on devices that have the ability to, to man in the middle network traffic on, on untrusted hotspots. So we also provide that capability as well. Then we can do the host threat analysis, which is where we look at vulnerabilities in the operating system. If we sense that, that an exploit has been delivered to the device and if a malicious configuration has been deployed to the device as well. So we're looking at the applications, the network and the operating system, which builds up to our full threat framework capability. So how does it work, I hear you ask? Well, it's pretty straightforward. We require an app or a footprint on the device, which allows us to look at the behavior. We are not interested in user information. We're not interested in any data on the device. We purely want to capture metadata about the apps that are on the device, how they're interacting, the, the services and the operating system build and configuration, how that's interacting, and also the networks that the user is connecting to and the, uh, the behavior of those networks. So we're really interested in you know, system, app, and uh, you know, uh, metadata on the device. That data is then sent to, on a periodic basis, the behavioral risk engine. So this is a cloud service where all the heavy lifting takes place. So we don't require any horsepower on the mobile phone, which of course would be very detrimental to user experience and battery life. All of the processing is done in the cloud. From here, we can make a judgment call on risk. So if we see certain aspects of the phone that are you know, potentially risky or warning, we provide that information to an administrator to make a judgment call. And if we see things that are outright malicious, that's where things get interesting. So many organizations I speak to already have security operations personnel. They have established processes for dealing with threats on endpoints. And they also have you know, established security incident and event monitoring tools from which they gather intelligence, correlate incidents, and allow them to react effectively to the threats they're detecting in their organization. Today, many organizations have a blind spot or a dark spot when it comes to threats that come from mobile devices. So it's key to talk about our integration with SIEM tools, how we provide intelligence to those tools in order to join the dots when it comes to more advanced persistent attacks and campaigns against your organization because you can see which attacks are coming in from the mobile vector and then you can join the dots then with any attacks that are you know, coming in through web servers, SQL injection through databases or you know, generic attacks against uh, you know, traditional endpoints and Windows devices. So we give you full visibility of threats across your organization. We also integrate with your mobile device management. Many organizations I speak to, like I said, on the maturity uh, um, uh, pyramid, they start their journey with, mo with mobile device management, and it's key to highlight that we integrate with AirWatch, MobileIron, good technology today, and we're increasing the number of integrations that we offer in the future to allow you to provide closed loop remediation. So what that means in English, is that if a device is infected and it exhibits you know, risky behavior, we can ask the MDM to deliver a restrictive or a quarantine profile down to the device. So this might, for example, stop the device from talking back into the network. It might remove certificates or remove email from the device, uh, thus stopping it from infecting other devices or connecting into the network in order to exfiltrate data. So you're basically saying device is infected, deliver a quarantine profile until we've removed the threat and then we will circle back and reinstall the original profile back to the device for full connectivity, all independent of the user, all done in real time, all done behind the scenes. So it's a very, very powerful message and a powerful story about integration, and it's important to highlight that that's where mobile threat prevention adds the most value as a part of your existing security strategy, your existing security architecture, enhancing your capabilities for mobile devices and providing full visibility across the board. Okay. So um, how does that look in the real world? Well, do you remember that uh, infection on my mobile device from earlier that stole data and voice traffic? But if I head over to the mobile threat prevention console, <clears throat> so this is a SaaS product, no infrastructure required. We host this for you in the European Union, so you don't have to worry about safe harbor. <clears throat> Landing on the dashboard page, I get an overview of mobile risks inside my organization. And uh, I may want to, obviously I know the device in question here, it's my demo device, 
So I might want to just go down into that and um, make a investigation on that mobile device. So you can see that the um, device is infected by the mobile conference application. And I can show you the application analysis, the application ID, the certificate of who created that application. And of course, things start to look a bit suspect if you don't recognize the vendor. And certainly start to get suspect when we drill down into the capabilities of this application. So straight away, this is you know a who's who of bad behavior. You can access calendar, track location, access carrier info, access your contacts, and as I demonstrated, you can hijack your microphone. So with these particular permissions, this application exhibits the capability to manifest the following behavior. Exfiltration of logs, exfiltration of calendar events, it can steal your text messages, of course, it can steal your sound recordings and take your contact data. So yeah, you probably weigh all these attributes up as a pretty offensive, pretty malicious application. Um, of course, the value in the product is now I can see exactly where this is deployed. So that, you know, this might be in the example I showed earlier, an application that's developed with the Xcode Ghost Toolkit. So you can see exactly where it is across your organization. Same story for, you know, you can find jailbroken or rooted devices. You can find devices that are running, you know, uh, packet sniffers and any other applications in there. So you get full visibility across the board of <clears throat> mobile risks in your organization, which is something that typically organizations do not have the capability to do today. I would like to integrate this with the other security insights, the other security visibilities they have across you know, endpoints, servers, and other security infrastructure. So what can I do about this from an end user perspective? Well, here's where I actually move over to my second device and I show you the remediation steps that we can take to clean up this problem. Okay, so I'm now showing my second device with you which is uh, protected by Checkpoint Mobile Threat Prevention. So this product uh, to the end user appears as just another app on the uh, on the um, on the main workspace, and uh, you will notice that I've got a push notification up here saying oh, I've got three mobile threats on this particular device. You also get banners and alerts in the operating system as well to show you that uh, you know there's threats on the device. So the end user sees um, a UI just by tapping in, which highlights the big scary virus symbol that there are things wrong with this device that we need to take action from. So typically, upon seeing this, you just tap the main uh, red blob in the middle, and you see that there are there's a whole number of problems with this particular device. We're not in a good in a good shape at all. Well, a conference application I installed, I head across, and it tells me why it's malicious and what I need to do. So what I would do is, in, a, in the Apple world, is simply follow the steps, sign out to the dashboard, and get rid. In the Android world, we're a bit more flexible, so we can actually add a button inside the UI of the application, which removes all of the malicious applications for us automatically. But in the Apple world, you know, you've got, you've got Steve Jobs to thank for this. Everything is user-centric, user-driven, user-controlled. So the end user has to remove the malicious application. Same situation with the suspicious profile I've got installed. So, you know, I, I do a, another demo where I show a network attack, but I wouldn't have time for this today, unfortunately. So if you're interested in that, feel free to uh, get in touch with Bytes and uh, we can schedule something up for you. But what would I do in this situation as a second step I also have the means by which to protect my data while there is an active network attack on here. So, you know, in this circumstance, you know, the end user might be, not be confident what to do to remediate the problem. Um, so they can temporarily protect their network traffic by approving a VPN. So what they would do with this VPN is just approve a profile. And this would then encapsulate that traffic through a new VPN profile that would essentially break the attacker's ability to exfiltrate data from the device and also activate bots in order to um, communicate with command and control servers. So if I was using this uh, VPN protection capability, it would actually break and stop the previous demo that I showed you guys where we exfiltrated data from the phone. So it's a very, very effective temporary protection measure 
that we can use to you know, secure the device while we're waiting for security operations to respond, or while we're waiting for the end user to make a decision on the best way to move forward. And of course, when we talk about the integration with the NDM tools, we can start to push these capabilities automatically and uh, remove that end user reliance as well. So there's a nice integration story once again using the NDM to apply protections while devices in a risky state. So with the mobile threat prevention, the end user got a pop-up, very easy, very easy to understand and follow to remove the, the infected application. And I was given a means by which I could protect my traffic in the meantime while I speak to somebody in security operations to find out, you know, maybe if I'm not a tech savvy end user, what well, the best thing to do now is to fix that problem. So hopefully that gives you a few insights into you know, how easy it is to, uh, to live with as an end user perspective and, and how low impact and low footprint it is on the device as well. So there's no AV scans, you know, there's no battery drain, there's no additional overhead required at all. We, temp we, we, we look at the behavior on the device and we use uh, the analysis in the cloud and the sandboxing technologies in the cloud to determine threats to the device and what the best way forward is for the end user. Okay, so at this point, um, I want to talk about our second product capability that we have, which is uh, predominantly focused on laptops and protecting laptop devices. Um, of course, 81% of organizations are still using laptops for most of their mobility requirements. So it would be you know, crazy not to include protection for roaming laptop devices. So Checkpoint has innovated the way that we deliver security to devices by um, conceiving security as a service through a VPN client on a laptop device. So the way that it works is it redirects traffic to the cloud in order to leverage Checkpoint security technologies as a service over the VPN. So without any hardware required, we host all of the hardware in our data center. You can have URL filtering and application control for um, policy to enforce your, your internal policies to roaming devices, intrusion prevention, anti-bot and antivirus to protect against known threats, and also our new threat emulation technology to protect you against unknown and zero-day threats in the cloud. So very powerful capabilities provided as a service. If you're already a Checkpoint user, fantastic you can replicate policies that you use on-prem into the cloud. And lastly, a very useful use case for branch locations. If you have a number of small locations with a small user account, it might be cost prohibitive in order to site. So you would maybe get more value from deploying a VPN from you know, commodity routers or switches on those small locations in order to create a cloud VPN connection and consume all of the security services for that branch location over the VPN connectivity rather than having to deploy hardware, supporting hardware, patching, configuring and maintaining hardware at small sites. So last but not least, I just want to focus on how we protect information and applications on your mobile devices. So this is our capsule workspace product and I showed you this very briefly in my demo where I logged into my email and I showed some of the applications that I have inside my workspace. We can also do document security in there as well, where we classify and encrypt documents. So we apply classifications to a document, you know, for example, restrictive, which controls who can access the data, and we can audit, audit who has access to the data, ensuring the right people can see sensitive documents. And also, if we happen to use cloud storage, you know, the dreaded Dropbox, then we can make sure that the security follows the document and uh, you know it's safe on what you would call you know public cloud storage or unsafe storage mediums. And then finally, the capsule workspace provides a secure container on your mobile devices. This is all powered by checkpoint appliances. So this is a software blade for the checkpoint appliances, which allows you to publish applications and services into a mobile workspace through the checkpoint uh, technologies. The idea is that we give you business applications that users need, you know, like I said, the usual suspects are all there, and then you can publish additional services either as HTML5 or native applications for the plat platform in question. So the real value in this is we protect your business data everywhere and provide a secure, authenticated container for the end user to use for business purposes, especially on an untrusted or a personal device. So, Going back to the very beginning of my presentation where I said why the world needs better mobile security, well, just to sum everything up, it's because mobile devices are ubiquitous, we use them for personal and work, therefore they contain 
data sensitive to us and the organizations that we work for. They're broadly unprotected. They are easier to attack than many, many people believe. There are more threats and vulnerabilities than, than many people appreciate. And uh, as a result, it would be wise, in, in my view, to enhance the security maturity of mobile devices and add additional layers of protection to your mobile workforce. And of course, Checkpoint has the capabilities and solutions to provide the additional security as a market leading security firm, We've been in the business a long time, and uh, we believe we've got the right products uh, for these use cases. Um, thank you very much for your time. Uh, I believe at this point, correct me if I'm wrong, Shona, we would open the mic to questions or text questions. Um, looking for some guidance on that from you there. Absolutely. Um, thanks, everyone. Um, so at this point, um, I'd like to invite you guys to enter any questions into the questions box or the chat box. Um, so that you have the opportunity to ask Phil any questions. I will relay those to Phil and hopefully you will be able to um, hear those being answered. We'll also answer them in writing at the end as well. Um, I do have one question um, very quickly. I just want to check that I'm clear enough though because I've been offline for a little while. Yeah, you sound fine to me. No problem there. Okay, perfect. So, um, Question: A very quick question was um, just to clarify. You mentioned um, a number of mobile device management vendors. Um, can I just clarify which ones that Checkpoint currently work with, um, and which ones that um, that may be in roadmap or you may be in, in talking to at the moment? And it's just a question from one of the audience members. Yeah, sure. So current support list is uh, Good Technologies, Mobile Iron, and uh, AirWatch. In terms of future roadmap, we're exploring new vendors to bring on board for our device management. We're actually really interested to hear from customers on basically what you would like to see in order to prioritize our development uh, efforts. So um, I don't have a definitive list of the vendors that we would be roadmapping, uh, although I'm really interested to hear in any suggestions or, you know, whether we'd like to see IBM Mass 360, whether you'd like to see Microsoft Intune, Whatever it is, we're really keen to capture those requirements from our customers because that means then we can focus our efforts on developing integrations for the right MDM vendors that are being used in the marketplace today. Perfect. Um, thank you. Um, so that's all I have through on the questions box just now. Um, I'll just give a couple of minutes um, so, if, so that people can actually type those in. Um, once again, there should be on your right-hand bar, everyone, a questions ability where you can type them in. If you've got any questions on any of the threats that Phil showed on any of the technology or how that integrates with what you've got at the moment. Okay, I haven't had anything through to anyone as it stands. Um, I'm assuming that, that Phil's quite comprehensive presentation has, has sort of whetted your appetite enough this morning. Um, so all that remains for me to do is to thank Phil very much for his time and his, you know, his efforts in taking us through the demos and the, the presentation today. And thank you all for joining us. Um, just again, I will reiterate that we will be, we have recorded the session, so I will make that available to yourselves along with the presentation slides um, from Phil um, post webinar for it, so that you can um, actually share that with your teams. I think that was someone's just popped a quick question about the recording, so I thought I'd cover that. Um, thanks everyone, and good morning.